be ISM around that. I mean, it's great on that. I mean, I spent uh, two years here and that was an amazing time. And I get very valuable skills and expertise. I, uh, I mean, that helped me to overcome the water that I had uh, in London. So the transition was very smooth. <laughs> Nothing uh, serious. Um, when, I, when I went to London, I thought that I was registered in business school and I, I will do my research in business school. But actually, I was told that uh, I'm doing interdisciplinary work, so I have to be not only in the business school but also in the computer science department. So, uh, three supervisors were assigned. So, I have three supervisors, and it's very hard to be supervised by three people and three, of three? three yeah oh, and wow. actually two of them are one is a mathematician the one is uh, expert in computational optimization and the other one is an uh, economist and especially interested in energy policy um, so we were talking uh, with Mr. Rajan and uh, I was saying that uh, doing PhD at Imperial College uh, which is well known, I mean, the best in interdisciplinary research uh, around the UK and I guess in Europe also. Uh, it's very tough because I have to do double <laughs> on the other side because I'm supervising the two department. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, we sli slightly changed the topic, I mean, the title, uh, uh, because it's a uh, um, uh, this gives more information, not to be more specific, but it's, um, I will talk about renewable energy and we'll skip to uncertainty uh, that it's prevalent in the UK electricity market and we'll talk about some optimization models and uh, energy models. But, um, uh, but uh, myself, I'm more interested in wind energy uh, because I'm doing research on wind energy and specifically I'm doing uh, research on offshore wind. Uh, because, um, because UK has most uh, capacity uh, in Europe uh, in offshore wind uh, and more and more projects are being built. So the overall portfolio is, uh, is very attractive for investors when there, there, there is much offshore wind. So, but wind uh, has some problems. For example, load factors. You know that sometimes wind blows, sometimes it doesn't blow, and um, it varies also whether the turbines are on, on shore or on offshore. Yes. Uh, in the uh, ocean or in the sea. Um, and uh, wind turbine, we can see from the power curve, uh, um, uh, when wind speed is high, then we get much uh, load factor. Um, uh, there are more than 4 gigawatt installed offshore wind capacity in the European Union and more than 50% uh, capacity is in the UK and as I said already uh, many projects underway and but it has high investment costs low variable costs basically it has no fuel costs and the major problem is that the intermittency and this will uh, will grow when um, in future there are more uh, offshore wind penetration in the UK uh, electricity market and they should deal with it. Um, the impact of intermittency is a short term balancing because the system operator has to match um, uh, demand and supply. So it's a huge problem for system operator if there, if there is a lot of wind. Um, so high level of wind will raise this, yeah. And the estimated cost of um, intermittency is between 500 and 1 million pounds. Uh, I mean, uh, all the UK electricity and energy policy always looks ahead and it plans 
uh, what uh, energy market will look like in 2020, 2030, and based on that <laughs> estimates, uh, calculate uh, whether the plans go uh, right or wrong. Uh, but do we? Uh, what, what does that mean though, estimated cost due to intermittency? What, what's the exact, is the cost of the sort of revenue, um, revenue not collected? Yes, I mean, um, if you cannot serve the demand, what's the, what's the impact of that would be? Because, for example, system operator has to give some electricity, for example, if you are talking about electricity. So the replacement cost replacement of cost. the energy not yeah. created, that's yes. it, they are mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Um, uh, you know, the wind provides energy equal to 30% of its capacity, but the reliable capacity is 10%. Uh, but it has some spare capacity, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, will help or not. Um, so it's an uh, energy flow for UK. Uh, we can see that oil mainly is used in transport for transport and heat, uh, also uh, gas, gas for heat, and renewable power, it basically goes to electricity. And please, um, you, speak about, you can see that it's a uh, renew renewable uh, flow of renewable sources. Basically what this shows that uh, either it is uh, it is lost, or it goes to the electricity. So, it's uh, different types of renewable sources. Um, and this is a generation in Great Britain uh, for a particular time, for example, November 2011. And we can see that uh, this is, uh, okay, uh, uh, there are three types of uh, Gen uh, generation plants, uh, generating plants. The first one are called base load, base load plants. Uh, basically, they are nuclear, and all the plants that have low variable costs, uh, but um, uh, yeah, of course, uh, high investment costs. And mid load plants, uh, which are combined cycle uh, gas turbines and um, sometimes coals, but coals are more going to the peak. Uh, and this is a, a generation mix for UK. We can see that it imports also electricity from France, and the rest goes to hydro. <coughs> so this is a picture for UK, and if we look at the future, the wind power uh, will have more surface uh, in this. We each, each generation in Great Britain, yes? Yeah, generation Good, uh, means France. France, it means whatever is left in imports from France. Uh, the difference, the gap that is there. Because in Europe, for example, not only the uh, UK is connected to uh, Sweden, to Denmark, uh, whenever it needs some electricity, it has some electricity shortages. It can just uh, online. It can ask and then import electricity. So it's a very highly developed. Uh, they have very high developed grids, and they are there connected. Vitali, each tooth is one day, right? Um, no. Measured in half hour from midnight on one November. Yeah. The whole thing is one day, right? No. Which one? Yes. It is. No. This one? Is this no, no, no. You think what this is it showing? The electricity seven consumption days. This for one, one day week. measured in for one hour? week. Uh, it's, um, from one to seven November, right? It's, uh, oh, okay, for one week. Okay. One week, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can see the variations mm -hmm. day to day. Yeah. Um, so, estimated uh, UK renewable capacity in 2020. We can see a lot of wind, onshore, offshore. Some goes to tidal, some to uh, wave, and some other sources. So this is kind of a benchmark for policymakers to uh, to achieve that. 
and we had targeted that in 2020. I won't uh, speak about that. Um, uh, in uh, 2020, 20% 20 from all, uh, all energy should come from renewable sources. But in 2030, they targeted that 80% should come from renewable sources. So, um, but looking at these steps, how they go, uh, it doesn't sound plausible. Um, and my aim, now I will go to the invest, some investment issues and uncertainties that are in this market, is to show that investors can basically improve uh, their um, investment strategies when they invest heavily in offshore wind. Uh, that's one of, one of my aim, uh, one of the aim of my research. So, um, Electricity policy plays a huge role in UK. I don't know how about the other countries, but because it has many schemes, for example, uh, it has um, decarbonization policy, they call it decarbonization policy. And basically, what it does um, create some tools for generators to use them to get some <coughs> subsidies, with, uh, called, but actually, they are not subsidies. For example, renewable obligation certificates, they are green certificates, uh, mm, they are called renewable of rocks in the UK, uh, which basically certificates that are traded uh, and uh, like costs uh, are split from uh, consumers to uh, producers, from producers to suppliers, and depending on the situation, uh, uh, and there's a governing body which called OPTIEM that uh, governs all these um, uh, circulation of uh, rocks. And the same is... And so is it like carbon credits? Uh, kind of, yes. Carbon credit, but more carbon credit in terms of the feed-in tariffs. <coughs> because feed-in tariffs, there are two types of feed-in tariffs now. Uh, feed-in tariffs contract for differences. Uh, it's like um, you sign a contract for 20 years and you agree to get, uh, for example, a price, whatever you sell, and depending uh, at what price you sell in spot market, you get the differences uh, topped up. Uh, uh, for example, if you agree at 70, right, price, if you sell at spot price 120, you have to give back. Uh, the remaining part. But if you sell less, then the system, whatever governing body is, will give you the rest. This is called uh, feeding tariffs of contract for difference. It, it means a fixed price, but if it fails, then there is a premium feeding, feeding tariff, which means whatever you sell in spot market, uh, you will get some extra bonus, for example, 20% or 30%, and it also will fluctuate. Uh, like this for uh, March. Uh, and the rest uh, comes from European uh, policy. Uh, for example, carbon price law. They don't have carbon price law, but they took from European Union policy and they just added some number and they increased for UK. For example, you should pay for carbon 15.7 uh, uh, pounds per ton CO2 emitted in 2000. 13, it is a straight line that it goes up and it reaches to 30 pounds in 2020 and it goes even higher. And there is an emissions performance standard. Uh, you cannot uh, you cannot emit more than 450 gram CO2 per kilo hour produced. Uh, basically bans um, construction and no fuel stations with a lot of capacity. Uh, so is it a uh, standard? Because for standard coal, is, it would be hard to keep this standard. Yeah, I mean, you cannot produce more than this. I mean, if you, Even you, should, you should give some penalties otherwise. What? If you use coal for power generation, mm -hmm. should you keep this standard? Because yes. it would be hard to do so. Then uh, the aim of the... Extremely the hard. The aim, <laughs> of the aim of the policy is to uh, reduce this kind of plants. 
I mean, but this is the nature of physical output when you burn coal. It's how can you avoid it? But the system has to uh, come to that level. This is what I say. Is it average? It's the system it's average, system. Not, not the plant average. Yeah, this is system average, yes. It's not plant. Um, and also, the, the, there's a capacity mechanism which basically deals with security of supply because they, they say, okay, the carbonization policy, but how are we going to secure affordable, uh, cheap, meeting all the requirements, all this in collection that they discussed in the capacity mechanism? Um, what I'm interested in is more about the firms that uh, want to invest in uh, uh, electricity generation. So uh, I said 20%, uh, but it's uh, actually 15% 15, 15 should come from renewables in 2020, which basically means energy will come from uh, renewables. It basically means that more than 15% will, uh, of electricity will come from renewables. Without um, big hydro, probably. Without, yeah. Uh, each yeah, country without, in without EU, uh, each country in EU has adopted, uh, you know, their own guidelines for achieving by 2020 or 2050 mm -hmm. or whatever. So the m most strict is UK. Um, if we compare, uh, yeah, they they set higher standards for them. Mm -hmm. And they want to be the one. But not that high. There are countries in EU that have set much higher. Uh, goals for them for 2020. 15% is, I think, average for EU. Yeah, for 2020, I agree, but for 2030, it goes 80%. Oh, kind of. That's just, they want to, I don't know, what's the logic behind it? But, uh, it's about Russia, it's a, yeah. it's a policy against Russia. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Russian gas. Yeah, so. um, the investments are made by big companies, uh, the British gas. EDF Energy here on UK and and the six uh, big the uh, big six. Um, the problem is that if they go through this decarbonization policy, that will create problems for these big companies, and they will not be interested in investing. And basically, they looked all the aspects uh, of their policy, and they want to attract more medium size and uh, small size companies to come and invest in UK electricity, uh, electricity market. So, I don't know, this is kind of uh, very impressive, uh, very demanding. Um, well, now that investment, uh, there are some strategies, uh, investment decision making, uh, and I'm looking how to basically uh, to model this in, uh, investment in electricity market. Um, basically there are uh, two types, uh, more types, but basically they look at, uh, if it's stoch if you look at uncertainties, then you will be, you will look stochastic models. And if it's dynamic, then it means dynamic and stochastic. You go to the real options, basically you use dynamic programming or uh, stochastic programming. Uh, but if you use just stat static NPD, uh, it's deterministic and static, and it has some drawbacks, I all know. Uh, NPD is just one lump sum investment, and you just invest and wait uh, a period and get some reward. Uh, in the contrary, in the real options, you, you deal with the incoming information, and then you update your investment policy each time. So this is kind of introduction, what the investment strategies are, uh, and particularly in, um, there are two types of models, short-term and long-term models in uh, investment uh, in electricity. Uh, the short-term models are uh, basically are unique commitment models, uh, which basically means uh, what you want to build and uh, operate. Uh, and they are solved, uh, these kind of problems are solved with dynamic programming, mixed integer programming, unique, uh, maybe I should say what the unique commitment means. Um, 
For example, if there are different units of energy sources, and your job is to determine what, which plant should operate, which do not. So this is a problem, uh, and if you bring it to the mathematical form, they become, for example, mixed integer programming problems, which are very hard to solve, and sometimes they become intractable. That's why uh, some heuristics are used, uh, for example, Lagrangian like relaxation is used to facilitate this, uh, this problem. But basically, this kind of unit commitment problems uh, suffer from this dimension, cursive dimensionality. <coughs> and they, sometimes uh, there are no algorithms to solve them. Uh, the other ones are called economic or generation dispatch models. It basically comes up to unit commitment problems when you already specified which kind of uh, which sources should operate and then how much they should serve to the system operator. Basically, there are linear programming models. Uh, uh, if uh, number of constraints and number of uh, unknowns are very large, so you, you can use heuristics. For example, slate or the stock is one of them which basically mm, ranks um, plants or sources based on the variable costs. The first one is, for example, nuclear, biomass, and then comes gas, coal, and then uh, again, um, <coughs> other uh, sources. The long-term models are passage and expansion problems, and it's like, uh, uh, dealing with um, and through time, which uh, how much uh, capacity should be added. Capacity expansion is not for electricity, but generally capacity expansion. It means that you are dealing with time and scale. But for particularly in the electricity market, uh, it means that you should solve uh, multi-stage stochastic programming problems. Or you can, uh, depending on the model, you can you can use stochastic optimal control. Uh, but this excludes the facilities location problem because if we include facilities location, uh, it becomes uh, very hard to solve. That's why it's sometimes complicated. Um, time and scales are very important in technological expansion. So, what are uncertainties? Uh, uh, 10 uncertainties, but there can be more. Uh, first one, electricity demand level, it is projected that it will rise, and it's very hard to, yeah, it will rise, but how much it will rise and what the pace will be, and uh, that, that creates uncertainty for investors. Fuel prices, another source of uncertainty. Gas, oil, etc., because some uh, prices are correlated with gas and oil. Um, Electricity spot prices because uh, electricity is traded in spot prices or if you have some bilateral contracts, you are kind of secured uh, from these spot prices. Um, carbon prices um, will rise, I mean, or may fall, I don't know, that, that, that is kind of uncertainty. Climate, of course, climate fluctuations, for example, rainfalls, and storage is a uh, there's a huge research going on in, uh, on storage in the UK, in Europe, in the US also. Uh, and now it is considered uh, not viable. However, there are some um, new technologies that can store, they say that they can store electricity, but it's so negligible and uh, the costs are so high that uh, they are practically um, inviolable. So, storage and holding costs, if it's viable, then that creates uncertainty what the costs what the cost are. The policy change in our issue, I, uh, I particularly for UK, it's a huge, uh, huge uncertainty. Uh, technological change, I think it's uh, for any, any sphere, for any industry, this is uncertain. And also the investment costs. Uh, for example, uh, for offshore wind, um, investment costs rise, and it has some objective and subjective uh, um, reasons why it rise. 
because new technologies arrive and offshore, the uh, distance from shore uh, deepens and uh, new turbines are built in uh, deeper places and that's why the cost, cost rise. But uh, it, it has some trade-off whether it's uh, useful to have this kind of turbines because investors don't want to spend much money to invest in uh, offshore wind. Um, Vitaly, sorry. If, if going back to the, if you have the electricity demand level being an uncertainty, why don't you have the intermittency in this list? Intermittency. Um, uh, climate fluctuations probably yeah. represent. I don't it's climate, not really. Yeah, we can include in this, but. But that's a very maybe unique, maybe unique. Maybe issue, but it's yeah. More specific to maybe. Wind energy, right? No, sun has so, intermittent. So, 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 Hydro has yeah. intermittent. But it's, it's uh, for portfolio, I mean, for energy, right? Because fuel prices concerns to every source. Carbon prices. It basically maybe, maybe covers almost it. everything. That's why. Maybe I should have included it, but. Because it's such a unique characteristic of renewable energies, you know, that the, the fact that they're so uh, unstable yeah. as a source. And yeah, I agree. Yeah. Though some of them aren't. Except hydrogen cells, of course. No, not a, a hydro, geothermal. Something. Yeah. There are some. Um, Ultimately, what I want to create uh, from my research is to create a model uh, which will best describe um, UK uh, invest, uh, investment atmosphere. Like, there are different models, for example, PICE, Project for the Planet Evaluation System. It's an uh, energy system model. That was first implemented in 1970s in um, US. Uh, NEMS, for example, also in uh, US. Uh, but um, the problem is that uh, these models are, some are simple. They use linear programming approach. Uh, some use heuristics, for example, MetaNet uses some algorithm, which is interactive algorithm. Um, for, and some use simulation, uh, but my aim is uh, uh, I want to create long-term investment model for UK electricity industry, and it will, will be uh, designed with the uh, help of stochastic programming, maybe dynamic programming or dynamic stochastic programming, and will have some game theoretical aspects because. Because of these renewable certificates, um, because of these uh, many interactions in, uh, uh, in the market, that will create some different theoretical aspects. Uh, this is the ultimate aim. And so, is that the only argument why, why you decided to use this um, kind of methodology? There's, uh, there's, um, because there is no such a model in the UK now. Mm -hmm. And the reason is uh, because it's ongoing process, they are formulating their policy and there are some research, but nobody is just... Uh, actually, um, this dynamic dispatch model here mm -hmm. exactly. is... Um, yeah, this is... Um, it's not governmental, but... Um, it's like, they, they were the initiators for this model. Uh, this uh, incorporates this um, past expansion problem, also the uh, economic and generation dispatch model. And, but I looked their website and I looked this model. This is private one, that's why it's a question mark here. Uh, but when I looked at the description, they say that they are going to solve problems, they're dealing with uncertainty, they are using uncertain optimization problems. Basically, what they do is uh, uh, using simulation, mm -hmm. they call it uncertain uh, optimization on the uncertainty. Basically, it's not. 
it's more a private product, it's not academic or professional model. Right. right. It's going to cost you if you decide. To yeah, yeah. That's why, that's why uh, the argument is that we want to wow. have an academic model which will deal with all kinds of uncertainties, prescribed uncertainties, and then uh, we'll have some huge impact, uh, hopefully. Um, uh, my team, I have three supervisors. Mm. Uh, Richard Wynn is a key figure in energy policy. Uh, he's a professor of sustainable energy business at Imperial. Uh, Berg Rustin is a professor of computational methods from computer science and Dr. Thomas Park is also uh, from computational optimization. And this is my research title at Imperial. Optimization and investment decision making for an energy portfolio with a large amount of offshore risk. Basically, I want to convince investors that uh, our ultimate goal is to that portfolio that will have more offshore wind and we'll see uh, and, uh, in two and a half years. And after that you get a very comfortable job at an energy company. Yeah, uh, also from the industry, <laughs> not only from academia. So um, at what stage are you at right now? Uh, this is my first year. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of research, uh, literature review, and came up with my ideas and proposed, and I don't know, um, they said that some are good, some are bad, some are more ambitious, um, but uh, finally I could push and uh, like say I want to create a model for UK because, yeah, I know that there is a dynamic dispatch model, but it's not... Uh, it's not professional, and I want to create some, and maybe they will be interested in the model. And they said, yeah, that's a challenging, but we can do it. Um, in your research, or general, um, what factors uh, uh, the distribu distributed energy generation factor? how important it is for the decision making because we know that a lot of energy is lost through transmission 20% or more so I didn't see maybe I missed something but I didn't see that factor I think uh, um, being like this important is, one yeah. um, because I'm sorry why I said because you brought in examples of massive renewable energy production like offshore which goes the same path as traditional conventional yes. energy generation yeah. uh, system does. They are focused constantly in one place and then they distribute over the country. So why this factor is not taken? Um, or maybe I missed it. Right? No, I it's a more of engineering issue, right? Because uh, how the system is uh, built. Decision making is uh, uh, it's not yeah. exactly... Uh, you s l let me elaborate yeah. on yes. that if you don't mind. See. Uh, in the world now, we see a lot of tendencies, uh, as far as the renewable energy is concerned, uh, favoring distributed generation yes. on site. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I don't know what's the situation in the UK, but uh, it, you might want to consider that factor in your model, uh, meaning that, I mean, there are so many factors yeah. you mentioned. So maybe in the UK. The general policy starts favoring distributed generation, which means, which will affect offshore wind, right? Uh, so, what we suggest, I guess, is uh, think about it. Maybe you want to consider uh, this factor in your model. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there can be more aspect that I can maybe I have omitted uh, because it's uh, so much is going on and. Uh, First, it's the first year, and I'm uh, just looking for new. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll have a look. No. Yes. I'm sorry, I have a couple more questions. Uh, of course, EU is moving towards total liberalization of electricity and gas markets, and uh, right now there are even possibilities for distributed. Um, 
distribution system to be so liberalized that um, some companies just own the infrastructure and they charge specific rate for like moving electrons from point A to point B so retailers can just resell it. So in your opinion what works more efficient this way, I mean the way that EU is moving or vertically integrated uh, companies that it's just easier to <coughs> estimate specific costs and then you know keep them uh, based on public utilities regulatory commission's decisions to charge like specific amount and then somehow to regulate the prices that otherwise in the liberalized market might go like way um, personally I'm prone to the liberalized market uh, because uh, yeah, uh, they can be mass when they liberalize the market. Yeah, many firms will enter and then, uh, who knows what's going on. But uh, when you have a uh, huge, I mean, great country with uh, talented people who design a policy and they know what they actually want. I have read many policy papers and they deal with every aspect of each type of generation. For example, there are plants, uh, as you said, coal plants, right? How they can ban the production of coal plants in the 450. Um, but you can sequester the carbon, capture the carbon and so on. There's a carbon capture and sequestration model, and they already discussed it, and many just consider this as an option. If you build a plant, and you see that you are not within the limits, you can upgrade your plant and then yeah you are you are you can operate i mean uh everything is designed in detail but of course there are some uh, um, omissions and yeah. and the third and last question I don't know about it. Yeah. Uh, again uh, you also mentioned in the factors the demand side and uh, what will be uh, the role of energy savings and energy efficiency in this demand because demand might go in yeah. two ways. Yeah, it could be uh, larger uh, or it could be smaller yeah. due to this yeah. policy. Parallel to this policy, this decarbonization policy, they also promote energy savings. Uh, and there are some local companies who offer some consultancy and they go door to door. And they say, okay, if you unplug your iron, or go your isolation, isolation, we'll say isolation and your it's very system. highly, I mean, uh, developed, uh, and they uh, most most of the house households do. They they hire this consultancy and they do that. Uh, uh, recently, um, also there are some projects. For example, they say, okay, we'll bring solar solar panel and install on the roof of your house and you don't have to pay for your electricity. Whatever you produce, that will go to the grid and then they will distribute this and, but you don't have to pay anything. I mean, this that you create this electricity, that already pays for you. The others who, who don't have that, they pay for you. This kind of sophisticated uh, models exist in the UK. Um, nothing? I think that's great. I don't know. Thank you. Yes. There exists a number of uh, uh, models for energy market. Uh, oh, and uh, yeah. and uh, in these models, uh, there exists some type of dynamic system, differential, stochastic differential equation. I uh, would like mm, to. Mm, to ask, uh, uh, what, what is your new idea to improve the existence uh, of stochastic um, models? Uh, there are models um, generally about, uh, I mean, uh, for wind energy, there is a, a lot of research and they use stochastic models. But for UK, I mean, for the UK case, they don't go deep to uh, use this uh, stochastic uh, models and so on. That's why uh, um, my supervisors are one of the experts in this field and they say um, there are models uh, a lot. Uh, 
But the problem is that um, uh, for, for the UK, they don't use stochastic programming, for example. They don't use stochastic dynamic programming. They don't use robust programming. Uh, and they are experts in robust pro programming. And they want to create a system which will be robust. I mean, whatever policy, whatever uncertainty will be, it will be robust to the uh, inputs. But eventually, they want to achieve that. But uh, uh, now I'm not in the stage to decide which kind of algorithm I'm going to use. Uh, but now I'm more getting acquainted with uh, research and with literature review and um, seeing what the gaps are. And I want to design a model for UK. That's my advantage because nobody has done it. Uh, so. But there are tons of uh, research. On, uh, Surprises are uh, stochastic, random. Uh, we can uh, they simulate uh, differential uh, mostly. They simulate uh, yeah. since uh, for differential equations, stochastic. They we cannot write uh, explicit solutions. Yes, this is a problem. It's a problem. And That's then, why they simulate. Uh, they get some result and say, "Ah, oh, we are satisfied with this." We simulate up to 2020 or 50, and they say, that's the scenario. And uh, commercial companies, for example, Shell, um, Siemens, uh, they do their own research, uh, but we don't have access to this kind of research. Like, uh, maybe, maybe they have a model, but uh, we don't have access to that. Can you please go back to the list of uncertainties? Okay, so for example here, the policy changes and technology changes. Uh, do we have an idea how it will be modeled? Model. Um, I struggled about this. Uh, for example, uh, policy change. Um, it can be modeled, modeled like um, you can generate three or four types of possible policies that can be in the future. And then in your model, you can model it uh, like uh, integer variables. If it does, model occurs, then this comes to your model. This is like one, uh, I mean, the sum you can write. If one operates, that will be one, the others will be zero. So as I understand, the uh, modeling uh, will be based on some assumption and you will run some scenario based on the assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot predict which policies will be. Yeah, you, you cannot predict. Uh, you can't. I mean, you have some candidates. For example, in policy, uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, two types of schemes for uh, contracts. You can have uh, feed-in tariffs or you can have premium tariffs. You don't know which one will ultimately come. So you can have model one and then if it fails to switch to the other one, right? So you have, or you can uh, model it two different models with two different, like two different scenarios with this 